Hello, everyone, and welcome to Princeton University's Bedenheim Center for Finance. We're th thrilled to be joined this afternoon by Asif Hirji, a true thought leader in the field of blockchain, decentralized finance, and Web 3.0. Joining Asif for what should be a fascinating discussion on the future of financial services is Princeton professor Jonathan Payne whose work on the evolution of financial services via the adoption of new technology should help guide today's discussion. Asif, let me be the first to welcome you to Princeton. And before I turn it over to you and Jonathan, I'd like to remind participants to enter their questions in the chat box. With that, I'll turn it all over to the two of you to jump right in. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, yes, I want to reiterate that thank you very much, Asif, for coming and talking, it's terrific. Um, Perhaps as a first question to start us off, uh, can you tell us a bit about how you got involved in this uh, wonderful world of DeFi <laughs> and crypto and what, what, yeah. what's your background? So, so first of all, it, it, true pleasure to be here and you know, delighted to, to, to participate. Um, look, I'm a software engineer by background. I started my life at Watson Labs. Um, you know, I worked on a lot of financial services type applications because they're a giant consumer of technology. And in that, you know, I went through a series of iterations of my career. I helped build some of the world's, world's first direct banks and insurers. In dot-com one, I built what you would today call a robo-advisor. So I've been, I've been around <clears throat> fintech for a long time. I ran, Coin, uh, I ran Ameritrade and then Coinbase more, re more recently. And now I'm with a company called Figure where we're, we're using blockchain to do what I would call real world financial transactions. So like how to get a mortgage or, you know, pay your bill, et cetera. Um, and so as a caveat, you know, as a technologist, I, I, I see I see these things through the lens, through that lens. So take that, you know, take that into consideration as, as we go through this session. That's terrific. I mean, it, that's, that's sort of going full circle in the in the <laughs> in the world of fintech, I think, from, from various stages of adoption. Um, so I guess since this is a fireside chat about the, the transformative power of blockchain um, and Web 3.0, um, and these are both terms that are often used, but not always well understood. Um, I think a good place to start would be if you, you told us a bit about how we should think about the blockchain. What is the blockchain and what is Web 3.0? Yeah, no, it's a good place to start. So, so look, if you, if blockchain, crypto, whatever, Web 3, whatever um, label you want to put on it, it's, it's, it's not an asset class, right? A lot of people think of it, okay, I understand it. It's an asset class. It's a highly speculative asset class. You know, maybe, maybe that's how they think about it. And, and that's a very, very narrow way. Of thinking about it, and I would say it's an incorrect way of thinking about it. It would be as if you were in, you know, circa 1995 or 1996 and saying this internet thing is like an asset class, and I'm going to think of the internet companies as an asset class. It's not. You know, the internet proved to be something that was ubiquitous. It's every single company is now an internet company. Um, and I think you need to start with Web3 or blockchain is simply a way to build an application. It's the latest iteration of how we are building applications. In the last two versions, we went from mainframe based computers, which, you know, giant, you know, room size machines that operators used and you and I and others never got access to. We moved from that to distributed computing. Everyone got a, a, a PC and, and this thing called the internet came along and we were all, you know, doing self-service financial services. And then the next iteration was mobile cloud where everyone was doing things on their phone. Well, this is the third iteration. And the third iteration is we're going from mobile cloud to what I would call decentralized. And this is a very, fundamental shift, much different for the first two. The first two basically took the application yeah. and pushed it out further and further to the, to the edge and made the consumer do a lot of stuff self-service. And by the way, that was good for us. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather push the button and buy a stock myself than have to call a stock broker and pay extra to do that, et cetera, right? But, but the back end didn't change. So today we're in the ridiculous situation where we have, you know, 2022 versions of front ends and we have 1960s and 70s versions of backends running our financial infrastructure, right? This is why it takes two days for stock trades to settle on our system, et cetera. It's because the architecture is still circa 1960s. And what, the, what blockchain will do is it'll change that. And fundamentally, blockchain does two things. One is it allows for bilateral real-time settlement of transactions. And two is it makes what you and I would think of as the database, it makes it a open public registry that's available to everybody and not controlled by anybody. And if you take those two things together, what it does is it eliminates the need for intermediaries, right? And if you sit there and say, ah, it eliminates the needs for intermediaries, which, 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 which sectors of our economy are riddled with intermediaries the most? And you'd go, okay, number one is financial services and number two is healthcare. So we should fundamentally rewrite how we do financial services. And the problem to date is 
we, we really haven't delivered on the promise of blockchain. There, there is, an ins, I would argue, an insufficient uh, uh, set of progress against changing the world for the better for the average person using blockchain, right? There's a lot of talk about DeFi, we can get into that and so on. But again, all I'm trying to land on you is it's a way to build an application. It's going to be as pervasive as the rest of the internet was. Everything is going to end up being in some way, shape, or form a blockchain-based company. The difference this time is it's not the front end we're, cha we're changing, it's the back end, right? The database is going to become public and it's going to become decentralized. And that does, that does fundamental things for us, which gets rid of intermediaries. I think, so I guess before we move on to all the, 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 the things that can be built on the blockchain, I think that for a lot of the listeners, when they hear the word blockchain, they probably think about proof of work consensus on Bitcoin. And they probably right. interpret that as sort of slow and non-scalable and energy inefficient. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. crypto community, I mean, there's subsequently been a lot of developments in how we can think about trying to achieve consensus and try to try to scale up blockchains. Um, so maybe you could tell us a bit about, you know, wh why the kind of um, layman's view of, of the bit problems with Bitcoin have to some extent been solved or ameliorated and why, why blockchain is kind of ready to scale as a technology. Yeah, so, so it, you know, the very first version of what you would, you would think of as the internet was, was messaging, right? We, we, it was email. And the protocols we used for email were very lightweight. They were designed for one purpose, which is I need to get an e you know, I need to get a message from user A to user B anywhere in the world, et cetera. And you know, you, people would look at that and say, well, I can't, I can't build applications off that. I, I, that's not a rich experience and so on and so forth. And all of that, all that's true, yeah. but that's because the first use case was email. And as people built more capability, more and more use cases got built into the internet. And, and, and it, again, the analogy is similar. Bitcoin is one use case. The use case is store of value. The fact that it is resource consumptive and, you, and, and can be run on nodes that are basically just laptops is not a bug, it's a feature. It was designed that way on purpose because it, it tries to maximize the level of decentralization that's achieved in a, in a store of value network. It's not designed to be an application uh, layer that you can build other applications on, right? That, that it, it's not, so for computer scientists out there, it's not Turing complete. And it's, it's designed that way to not be Turing complete because it's solving a very specific use case. Yes. There are other blockchains like Ethereum or Solana or pick your favorite that are designed to be more like computing platforms that you can build other applications on top of. And they are, they don't use proof of proof of work. They use, or at least they're going to use proof of stake. Many of them already do, Ethereum will. That has a much lower uh, consumption pattern. It, it still has the economics that, that, that allow you to have decentralization. Like remember, decentralizing trust is hard. It's one of the hardest problems in computer science, right? And when I was at Watson Labs, like we struggled with that along with everybody else and whoever, Satoshi Nakamoto was he, she, or they solved one of the hardest problems, right, in computer science, and they did it in a very elegant way. So, so, you know, maybe that was too techy an answer, but I, I would not get hung up on, oh, Bitcoin is, is energy consumptive or Bitcoin. Like those, those are not bugs; those are features. And there are other blockchains which are designed to be application platforms that don't don't have those kind of traits. Yes, I think there's a tendency here to see things that are more design choices to try to do a yeah. very particular use as sort of technological constraints on the broader right. ecosystem, which is that's, probably not that's the totally right way correct. to think about this. That's totally correct. I would, I would tell you that regardless of the type of blockchain, because it's decentralized and the data is decentralized, it solves two of the biggest problems of the internet of today, yeah. right? So, yeah. so if, <laughs> you know, I, I was at Andreessen Horowitz, okay? And, you know, Mark, I was talking to Mark at some point, and he was saying the two biggest problems with the internet of today, the two biggest mistakes they made, right? Number one is they underestimated the value of data. They didn't, they didn't really build enough privacy control into the first version of the internet. And the second thing they did is you, you and I and everyone are all familiar with the HTTP 404 error, right? Page not found. Yep. There was, in the spec is written a, protocol, a part of the protocol, HTTP 405, payment not found. They never implemented it because it was meant to be that if you gend up a page, the page owner could charge you a, a micro fee for doing that. They never put it in. Because of that, we yes. have the internet of today where companies come along, these centralized companies come along, they give you a service, be it search or Facebook or whatever it is. Yep, yep. And in return for that free service of high utility, they suck all this data out of you and you are the product, right? It, it, it's, the, it's the old adage of, if, if, if the product is free, you are not the customer, <laughs> you are the product, right? They are selling you, okay? Blockchain solves that. 
because blockchain, no transaction happens for free. Every transaction requires even a micropayment for the resource consumption that that transaction is, is, is consuming because the database is now not centralized, it's publicly available. And because of that, you get you now restore control of that data back to the user and the user can for themselves decide who to expose that data to and for what reason, right? And, and so it, it, it is a fundamental shift from the, from the model we have of today. Yeah, definitely. I guess let me ask the question though about this control of data. So um, yeah. in some sense, it puts a lot of onus on the user to try to follow everything that's going on, right? So I guess mm -hmm. one, one thing people might feel is that um, they're sort of happy to have an intermediary manage all this because they don't want to have to pay attention to what's going on behind the scenes and where the data goes. And maybe part of the reason why yeah. we had Web 2.0 is people didn't care that much. Um, I mean, yeah. how, how would you think about this? You know, is, is this something yeah. you think is for all users or for some users? Or why, why is it valuable so, so, to my, my parents to have yeah, this? So, so look, I think, people? yeah, I think, I think there's some power law things that go on here, which is, look, if, if you, there are people, let me use a different analogy. There are people who will trade off money for time yeah. like they will actively pay to get time back and there are people who will trade off time for money they will actually invest more time doing things because it's cheaper okay there are way more people who trade off money uh who trade off time for money yeah. right they are worth a lot less as a as a customer than the people who are trading off money for time yeah okay yeah. and so just the law of economics will be such that even in this case, you will want to, to target the people who have the assets and that'll, that'll balance this. Now, okay, so let me give you a real example because you can abstract away a lot of this. Yes, yeah, let's, this let's get to a concrete example. You, you get a real today. example, okay. So let's, let's take Uber, you know, favorite app that everyone uses. Everyone uses Uber. Okay, one of the biggest problems with Uber, Uber knows where I live, knows where I work. It knows if I'm cheating on my wife because it can tell from my you know, pattern of who I visit. It knows my favorite restaurants. Like it knows everything about me just because of the network that it builds of my, of my commute pattern. It doesn't have to be that way, right? So let's say you and I and others decide we're gonna build Uber 2 on blockchain, right? One of the first things we do is we say, okay, how many tokens is this ever gonna have? Let's just say it's a million tokens for the sake of argument. Okay, the day we launch it, the, the tokens, by the way, should represent the NPV of the total value of the network. Okay, so day one, the, N the tokens aren't worth very much because there's not a lot of transaction, if any transactions on the network. And so what we might do is we go to a bunch of drivers and say, hey, if you would drive for us, we're going to give you these tokens and they'll appreciate in value as the network gets more, more, more valuable. Yeah. So we, we seed the, the initial drivers with a bunch of tokens. They start driving, customers start using it. The customers are buying the tokens to pay for the rides, right? Okay. And you abstract away the, that, that complexity by saying, hey, this, this ride that, you know, on Uber, it took me $20 to get to downtown. It's still $20 on Uber yeah. 2. It's just that, that that transaction is, is settled in, in, in Uber 2 tokens. I, I don't, as the customer, don't need to know that, right? Yeah. But the beauty of all this is all Uber 2 knows is a wallet that has the ability to pay wants to go from, if, if you don't like the term wallet, think account, okay? Mm -hmm. An account that has the ability to pay wants to go from point A to point B. And so a car shows up, that, that account gets in, gets dropped off, payments made, that's it. That, it doesn't know anything else. Doesn't know who that account belongs to, doesn't know any other rides that account did, like nothing. It doesn't need to know that, right? Now, if I, as the owner of that account, choose to expose more data to the, to the company, that's my choice and I should be compensated for that, mm -hmm. right? But that's how Uber 2 could work and it would work. And as, as more and more drivers get on and more and more users get on, the tokens get more valuable. That $20 ride is still $20. On the first day, it might've been 200,000 tokens. You know, a year later, it might be 20 tokens. And two years later, it might be a 20th of a token because the tokens have appreciated so much. Remember that the token count yeah. never changes. And the other thing that that does is yeah. the people who got the most value out of this growth in the network were the early adopters, the early drivers and the early users. That doesn't happen in Web 2. In Web 2, the early adopters seed this thing, but all the value goes to the centralized player, not to the users. And so that's why Web 3 projects are super interesting economically, as well as from a sort of civil libertarian point of view, because yeah. we, the early adopters of those products, are then reaping the benefit of whether those products ultimately take off or not, which I think a far better way of aligning interests between app developers and their customers. Well, in some sense, they're not just users, they're content providers in a way, right? So I think a, yeah. 
a big complaint yeah. about the way Web 2.0 works is that the people that provide so much of the content into these systems that generate these net network effects are not being rewarded. Right. It's the person who has right. monopoly control of the network. Yeah, um, the network effects in Web 2 accrue to the owner of the network. Exactly. Okay, so which is a centralized it, entity. The network yeah. effects in Web 3 accrue to the token holders of the network. Right? Which is a fascinating change. And I, I think it's interesting to think here about whether this could have been done in Web 2.0. So I'm going to ask you a question about how important tokenization is here. So yeah. tech companies often give equity stakes to early stage workers, right? To give sure. to make them sort of participants yep. in the future profits. Yep. But for some reason, they didn't decide to do this with early stage users or content providers. Um, do you think there's something about the tokenization that makes it more feasible to share, or do you think um, do you think yeah. this was just a mistake by these these companies the first time around, or what, what what's going on here? No, it's it's um, I, I, I first of all I think it's a very a very good question. Secondly, I don't think it could have been done Web two because mm -hmm. you cannot. It's very hard for you to give equity out to mm -hmm. early users. Equity, right? Do you remember all of the shenanigans that happened between the SEC and Uber when Uber said it wanted to give <laughs> shares to drivers? Yes, yes, yes. Right. It's going because to be the SEC, as well, right? yeah, the, the SEC was like, well, there's not a market here, and these they're not accredited investors. We we have like feet, literally feet of regulation around what you need to do with equity, okay, mm -hmm. and and that gums up the works to do something. A token is super simple, and I, by the way, I can I can it's very, it's also quite democratic because you can sit there and say, look, it doesn't matter whoever you are, if you're an early driver or an early, just to keep torturing that Uber 2 analogy, if you're an early driver or an it's early It's a great user, analogy. I think it brings out lots of things. So. Yeah, you can, you can get access to the tokens. By the way, you know, I had to buy some tokens to, to ride the thing. I could have bought only as many as I needed, or I could have bought extra and kept some, right? But, but then, by the way, you know, I'm going to go tell people, you should try Uber 2. It's a great service. Well, I'm now getting rewarded for doing that because I hold the token, right? And then token creates a community. So why do you need a token? The token is both the means of exchange on the network, which is how a blockchain works, but it's also the means of governance. So let's say Uber wants to decide whether it should allow, I don't know, kids under the age of, of 18 to ride or whether it should do handicapped vehicles or what, you know, pick whatever topic, expand into Europe, whatever the topic is. That then gets put to a vote mm. to the holders of the token to, to decide, should we do this or should we not do this? And it's and it, it's you know the, the the preponderance of the votes, whatever the, which way they vote, that's what happens. It, it's a governance mechanism for that network. Yeah, I think this. Um... And, and, and sorry, one one other thing: if you're a founder, you look at what's happening to the heads of Google and the heads of Twitter and the heads of Facebook and all the SEC stuff. You're getting companies today that are being formed. Nobody knows who the founder is. Right. Nobody knows because they're anonymous, right? You can't subpoena those people. You can't put them in jail either, right? Because they are completely anonymous. And the and the and the structures that run those things, when now we're going to get a little bit complicated at DAO, right? Those things are also driven by the users. And, and again, they are completely autonomous things. Like that's the future we're heading towards. I think it's a fascinating question. I mean, so this issue of governance is is very interesting. I mean, if we think about the way the current system works, in principle. Um, equity holders provide governance to companies and you know yes. these equity holders can be all kinds of people in the community and potentially users if they have enough wealth. Um, in practice though it's very difficult for ordinary shareholders to exert a lot of control over companies. Um, I guess I'm interested in your thoughts on you know how will so some of these problems might be to do with the difficulty of scaling up governance right when you have so many different yeah. people involved and you have to pay a lot of attention all the time. I'm interested in your thoughts on how um, sort of governance tokens will resolve some of the problems that have plagued sort of shareholder votes or for that matter, direct democracy participation and sort of many other voting schemes where it's just hard to keep people interested. Well, so I, I, don't, I don't know if you can keep people interested. Like that's a different thing. Like, you, you, <laughs> yeah, you, you that's could, a holy could, grail, right? I mean, that's yeah, <laughs> look, you could own the token and still be completely blase about whether you vote yeah. it or not. And if you don't vote it, that's fine. However, there's an economic incentive for you to participate, which is these networks, the proof of stake networks especially mm -hmm. require holders to stake the tokens to validate transactions, right? Mm -hmm. Literally what that means is when a transaction is presented, the token holders effectively vote on whether that transaction should be considered good or yeah. not good, okay? If the preponderance of token holders vote for that transaction to, to, be, to be valid, then it's valid. And so, yeah. and in return for voting, they get they get a slice of the transaction fee that was charged on that transaction. So there is an economic incentive to remain to remain active in the community. Whether that that you know that for sure creates an incentive for lots of people to at least stake their tokens and vote for transaction by transaction. 
Whether that means that they will actually vote on the governance things or not, that, that's a different thing, right? But I do think it's very, like, for example, we at Figure have uh, a cap table management solution. Think Carta, but entirely on chain, right? And the advantage of this is it's super easy to do primary and secondary raises entirely on blockchain. It's super easy to distribute the shareholder information entirely on blockchain. Why? Because I know exactly who the wallets. I don't know who they are necessarily, but I have all the wallet addresses that own them. I know how much they own. I let them. I can let them trans transact against each other bilaterally with no intermediary. And if the company wants to send something to them, it can send something to every single wallet. Right? That is not possible in the current world where everything is held sort yeah. of in in broker name and on the street name. And like it's it's a much simpler way of doing it. I'm going to um, pivot to a question from the audience, which is also a question I have sort of on, on roughly on this, this part of the discussion, um, which is I often hear proponents of DeFi argue that it can improve financial inclusion. This is one yes. of the questions that's been yes. asked. And I think this is a very, yep. a very appealing idea. Um, could, you, could you give some examples of how you think um, this might play out in practice? Sure. Yeah, I can give around. two. Let me just, yeah, raise one, can I just raise one potential concern in general Please. financial inclusion in DeFi, which is, in some ways, the, the one of the biggest reasons why people are excluded from the financial system is they don't have any collateral um, and they right. have a low credit rating. And it seems like a lot yep. of what I see in DeFi is highly collateralized. So you have to kind of get, get collateral yes. first before yes. you can participate. So maybe you could talk a bit about where, where financial inclusion might fit in and how we'd get around this problem of collateral. Maybe you get collateral by being a user, totally. for example. Yeah. No, so, so, so look, I, um, when I was at Coinbase, I, I, like I said, I come from a fintech background. I look yeah. at blockchain and blockchain should completely rewrite financial services. It should crash, it should literally, by taking the intermediaries out, it should crash the costs to the point where a financial transaction is no more expensive than sending an email, i.e. it's just the resource consumption of the, of the server, the network, the storage, et cetera, nothing else, right? The reason financial transactions are so expensive is because of all the intermediaries in the middle, right? right? So if I want to send you money, I have to rely on my bank they have to rely on the on the whatever payment transfer mechanism that they have in their country. And let's just say you're in you and I are in different countries. Then there's a correspondent bank involved. Then there's your bank. Then there's your bank's clearing system, etc. And by the time you add all the parties up and who's taking a slice, it's an immensely it's an immensely costly transaction. Okay, yes. so that's that's thought one. Thought two is I I really dislike DeFi as a comparison for financial inclusion. And the reason I dislike DeFi as a, as a comparison is because DeFi is basically traditional financial products aimed at people who are long crypto, okay? The people who are long crypto is less than 1% of the planet. And I mean, that's, it, it's, in, it's like 180 degrees the wrong way around of doing this. What we should be doing is saying, how do I leverage blockchain to make that financial transaction so cheap that the average person can do it? So let me give you two examples, okay? So there's a product that we have running called FigurePay, which is Chime, Venmo, Affirm, and Square all on blockchain, right? Yeah. You have little to no credit, you have uh, no, you know, no ability to, 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 to collateralize crypto because you don't own any. It doesn't matter. This is not, I mean, that's not where we are. Where we are is you can put cash into this thing, okay? It'll show up as a, as a crypto, it'll show up as a US dollar deposit in your account. Yeah. Yes. You, can pay merch, you can pay merchants with it. You can pay each other with it. And there are virtually no transaction costs for that because they all run on blockchain rails. Okay, so it's super cheap. And then if you sit there and say, well, look, I could use this for cross-border remittances. So, you know, think of the flow of dollars to pesos in Mexico, you know, US Mexico, or yeah. the flow of, of, you know, Indian rupees from, the, from Dubai into India, et cetera. And think of what those poor people are paying, yeah. right? For those transactions. Well, if, 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 I have a, if I have a blockchain wallet at one end of that, and I have a blockchain wallet at the other end of that, and I send a stable coin across, I do two things. One is, it now costs virtually nothing to do that. And secondly, the recipient can choose to keep the money they received in dollars or dirhams or something hard as opposed to converting it to pesos or, or Turkish lira or Nigerian, you know, Nigerian pounds or whatever it is. They're protected that way. And that's, that is how you start to get the financial inclusion. Okay, here's another, here's another example. In the United States, all you know, almost entirely all the home lending is done by non-bank financial institutions, right? They, they originate, they package, they securitize, they sell, okay? So in the traditional world, I would originate $100 million worth of loans, let's say mortgages. I would then go to the market and I would say, I have $100 million of loans to sell. Uh, they have this FICO score, this geographic distribution, et cetera. I'd get a bid, okay? In the meantime, by the way, I've borrowed the 100 million from yeah. somebody, right? And I've lent it out, okay? 
uh, I'm getting bids. I pick a I pick a winner. The winner then hires an auditor. The auditor audits my loans to make sure that they 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 are what I claim, and they look at the service history to see are they actually being paid on time. Based on all that, we settle a final price, and yeah. finally the transaction the transaction settles. It's probably ninety days end to end for all that to happen. You know, the hundred million is tied up. The loans are tied up. The collateral from the buyer is tied. It's a super expensive process. Yeah. Okay, we've turned that entirely on its head. So when we originate a loan, we when we get a, a credit score, the credit score provider stamps it, puts it on the blockchain. When we get the title, when we get the the title and so on, or the home valuation that's stamped and put on the blockchain, because of all that, there's no need for an audit. There's nothing to you don't have to trust me and hire an auditor to figure it out. You can just look on the blockchain and say what was the credit score, what was the home valuation, right? And so our buyers. We don't securitize anymore. Our buyers basically come to us and say, "I want California. I want FICO above 680, and I want uh, loan to value of less than le less than 80 percent." Every single loan we've originated that's still for sale shows up, and they can bid on it and buy it in real time in a marketplace. So we've taken a 90 day, super paper based, super capital consumptive process and shrunk it to five days. The reason it's five, it's it's really real time. But the reason it's five is because there's three days of rescission. So the borrower has the right to cancel their mind, you know, change their mind in three days. So it's, it's, it's a real-time process where capital is in coming in advance of the loans. So it's now not capital consumptive at all. And it saves over 120 basis points. Now, 120 basis points on the securitization market in the United States for homes, which is measured in the trillions of dollars, yeah. is an amazing savings that can go back to the homeowners, right? Because it should lower the cost of the average mortgage, et cetera. So that is how you get to financial inclusion through blockchain, which is blow up the, the cost structure Right or my on one of my, one of my other favorite topics like the DTCC, you blow up this whole two day immense amounts of margin right tied up in equities trading. You don't need any of that, right? It, it all goes away. All that cost structure is eliminated by using by using uh, wallet to wallet high you know uh, um, real time settlement on on chain. Could I ask? Um, so I think we can probably agree that there are some large inefficiencies in the current centralized financial system. Um, I guess in part though, they might be to do with kind of poor regulation or poor management of the current financial system. I mean, how much of this improvement yeah. you, you want to say? I mean, how much of this is just that they, they weren't competitive and they didn't adopt technology? And how much is specifically the fact that the technology that's being adopted is the blockchain? I, I think there's also a third reason, which is the regulation, which we yeah, can well, yeah, so, 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 barrier. Yeah. So I choose I choose to believe, I choose to believe, I could be wrong. <laughs> I choose to believe that most regulation exists because of something bad that happened. And so the regulators were like, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? Okay. Right. <laughs> and so and so the so that I think the intent is good. Yeah. I think the limitation is because the regulation is written looking at the current capabilities. It impedes any sort of technological progress because the new technology is not going to work the same way the old technology did. Yeah. So we have a whole set of rules that are designed around it takes us two days to settle trades that really it shouldn't take us two days. It, it should be instant trade settlement should be instantaneous. And if you went to instantaneous settlement, you wouldn't need things like reserve balances and you wouldn't need things like a bunch of Basel II rules around how much capital you've got to get because the settlement is instantaneous. So there, there is a regulatory component. Okay, let's just park that. I think the other thing that happens is because of the way our financial system has been built, you have these centralized players in control, like the exchanges or the DTCC or the SWIFT, you know, SWIFT or any of these entities, which I'm not saying that they're evil. I'm just saying they exist because of the way that we built the system. Okay, And because they're at the core of what we do, they have literally zero incentive to change. Because if we changed, they go out of business. So you will never fix the system by telling the incumbent centralized provider that it needs to change. You will fix the system by doing away with the centralized provider. By go but so when we are doing when we do stock trading, we don't go to the DCC and try and try and convince them that they should do it. it. That would be a waste of time. Or if we're trying to do mortgages, we don't go to Fannie and Freddie and say you should take you should take mortgages on chain. That would be a waste of time. What we do instead is we go to the originators and say, we have a, a system that can save you 120 basis points on loan origination. Are you interested? And they go, of course I'm interested. And you go, okay, it happens to be on blockchain. They go, okay, fine, I'll look at it. And then we have takeout, which is just as good as Fannie and Freddie. In fact, it's tier one banks that are buying these mortgages because they're so good, right? And so you move more and more of the volume there. And eventually, if you, you know, we, we now have probably 15 or 20% of the US mortgage market looking at this to adopt it. 
if 15 or 20 percent of the u.s mortgage market adopts it you can bet Fannie and Freddie are going to have to come along and say, okay, we have to adopt this. But they don't get there willingly and they don't get there first. They get there because the, the, the industry leapfrogged them in terms of, of the way it operates. Yes. So it's a great point. So I'm, okay, so I'm getting a lot of questions about an alternative future, I guess. So I'm going to, um, <laughs> so there's a few questions around, around this, which is, so I want to, I want to think, I'm going to take a step back a little bit and think about some of the yeah. theories that people put forward for why you end up with centralization and financial services to begin with. And one of the prominent right. theories is that large players are very good at using economies of scale and lobbying to be able to change regulation to protect their interests. And I'm getting a lot of, questions some of that. people saying, okay, but why, why wouldn't there be this response from these large centralized parts of the financial sector to, to force regulation in to kind of regulate this out or make it similarly mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in addition yeah. to other things. Maybe you could talk a bit about whether you, whether you, how DeFi might be able to overcome this kind of power right. of the centralized bank lobby. I, I think there is, there is, look, every, every you know, people, people, people and institution, institutions have a self-preservation instinct, right? <laughs> they do. It, it's natural. So again, I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe, I don't subscribe to the, the their evil notion. They're, they're rational, right? And so they're going to, they're going to want regulation that favors them. And, and by the way, I actually think regulators like having centralized players because regulators like to be able to go to one entity to control things, ideally. Okay, that is a hideous way for the rest of us to live, right? And so the, I start with technological progress is inevitable. You can't, the regulators can't stop blockchain from happening. All they can do is they can make it harder or they can push it underground, okay? But it will happen. And more and more applications will be built using blockchain. More and more applications will, will thrive globally on blockchain and it will be the way in which people transact financially and so the regulatory choice is do i push this in a way that that it becomes underground and then by the time i finally wake up do i need to do something it's too late because it's kind of evolved in a way that i had no control over or do i actually help in the evolution of this thing and so do i do things like saying okay look um it's decentralized i get it but if there's a fiat on an off ramp you have to kyc the user like, I need to know that it's not, you know, some North Korean terrorist who's just like taking it. Okay, fine. That, that's sensible. We can do that, right? And, and, and those kinds, I think that's a more constructive way of thinking about this, which is there are, there are things. Look, here's another, here's another stupid, stupid statement. If you apply the, the, the rules that we, tr that we currently try and apply to, to crypto transactions, you know, if you applied those to every form of payment, cash would be illegal. Right? Is, is that really the world we want where cash is illegal? If there are a lot of societies that are trying to do away with cash because they want to track every transaction. There is a dark side of all of this, which is like every technology. You can, <laughs> there, is, there is the dark version of it. And, and, and I think China is trying to go that way where they want to control every transaction and have you know, super insight into everything. Right? That's possible. But I think we'll land in a place where we're putting more control back to the user. We're giving them, we're giving them the ability to, to, to determine how much of the data to share while still allowing the regulator to make sure that, you know, it's a bona fide person or entity that's on the off ramps and the on ramps into that system. Right. I think you'd agree though, it's up against some strong forces. So if I think about the, totally. the sort of beginning of the current, so before the civil war in the U S you had a very decentralized financial system with banks issuing yep. their own money and they, and the U S government has a lot of difficulty financing the, the second world war, I mean, sorry, financing the civil war. And then they, they learn that by putting, you know, by, by sort yeah. of creating a national banking system and by putting um, government debt at the backdrop of that, they can basically lower their borrowing costs by maybe two percentage points. And this, this, and then they have this ongoing kind of desire to sort of this big influence and control over what's happening in the financial system. So I think you, you probably agree that you, there's some strong headwinds you have to work against probably to try to, to, try to get this to happen. Yeah, I, I think you can, yeah, I, I agree mm -hmm. that there are, there are huge incentives here. I think that though you can still, capture most of that like for example you could have the treasury issue a central bank digital currency and you could structure it in such a way that the treasury issues it only to banks so not to me and you and the banks then create their own coin backed by the the treasury coins and by the way that would be a much simpler way to manage credit risk because if you wanted to know how much credit you know if you wanted to know how much credit city had had extended count the number of city coins that there are in the world yes right and look at the wallets that those coins exist in okay how many of them are in hedge funds great Look at those wallets. That's a far simpler way of trying to do it than what we do today. What we do today is all based on, frankly, guesswork and ratios that have all the look and feel of financial controls, but yeah. none of the actual efficacy. Like Archegos could not have happened had we been using blockchain. Could not. 
because you would not have been in a situation where you would extend a credit to an entity you hadn't you, you knew nothing about right well it's great to bring up cbdc because i'm also getting some questions about that as well so maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll continue with that for a moment so it sounds like you'd be enthusiastic potentially about the about the issuance of a us dollar cbdc so, or what, are you, what are your thoughts yeah, about how that might help the, so, the development of DeFi? So, so, okay look so i i helped create USDC, which which is the you know the now today crossed fifty billion, and the reason we did that is because two two things. One is you had this thing called Tether, which is not backed by anything, right? Underpinning a lot of transactions, a lot of a lot of what, yeah, what we thought was fraud, and we were like, you know, the entire crypto market's going to crash because these idiots are running around with this thing, which is which is like completely unbacked. Let's create something that is backed, provably backed, right, yeah. and allows for real time settlement. So we created USDC and we created it not, it wasn't Coinbase that created it, we created it as a consortium of other crypto companies, okay? The mistake we made is mm -hmm. we let it go to any any wallet anywhere, right? Where, so so the banks won't touch it. So at Figure, we've created a version called USDF, which yeah. can only go between KYC wallets. And so now we have we have banks minting and burning stablecoin. We do, we're the first time ever in US history, banks are minting and burning stablecoin, it's USDF. Okay, so the libertarian in me says, we don't need central bank digital currency because these banks can do it. They have Federal Reserve, they have Fedwire, they can tap the Fed window, like it works. And in, and in that case, what is really happening is Fedcoin is just the balance they have at the Fed. And it's, and it's represented in the centralized ledger at the Fed as opposed to a decentralized ledger on a blockchain. But if you wanted to create it as a decentralized ledger on the blockchain, you could do that. And you can have CBDC. I, I worry if you then get the Fed saying CBDC is how you'll pay people, or CBDC is how you will uh, settle some transactions, because then you get into now you get into the surveillance state where they can track a lot of that stuff. And so that, that's why I say the libertarian in me doesn't like that idea, but but I think having a CBDC that's issued only to banks and then banks do credit creation on top of that is 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 workable. And by the way, the central the central bank shouldn't be in the credit creation business in the first place but it, but it workable but is it desirable to restrict to restrict public access to the public money if i think about the current system the government does issue a, a digital currency reserve so just restricts who can hold it um yeah. in some sense right. it seems a bit against the sort of democratic ethos of the, <laughs> of the web tree yeah, look, you, say, you, well, you, only certain yeah. people can hold this yeah it, it, you could you could do it and I, I just i would want it to be done in a way where it isn't mandated as the means of settlement right i see what you mean right it's not so, a legal tender um, or forced settlement. CBS. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think I think I can see that. And was the reason why you you created? So you talked about the USD. Um, so USDF. You have your uh, USDF. Is that right? Or, um, yeah. So USDF is the one that Figures created or helped create, and this which is, is now which is now being needs to to be for a bank to be able to hold it. They need to know who has it. Is this is this the distinction between the two? Yeah. So the distinction, I, I, I'm oversimplifying, right? right. <clears throat> USDC and USDF are both stable coins. They're both backed. Right. They both settle in real time. The difference is USDF can only go between bank KYC wallets. USDC can go to any wallet. The only time, the only time there's a KYC requirement for USDC is when you want to redeem it or you want to block it, to, to, to create it, yeah. right? Yeah, that makes sense. I guess on the topic of stable coins, so I guess there are collateral back stable coins, which I think most people yep. you know, look a lot like a narrow bank uh, back in the back in the day, you know, back yep. in the earlier periods. I guess there were also attempts at sort of algorithmic stable coins. Um, do you think yep. this? I mean, I find this sort of fascinating intellectually. I remember I set my my class an assignment yep. to try to, to build yep. a, an algorithmic stable coin, but it's it's sort of uh, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure it's going to work. Do you have some thoughts on whether? I think look, I, I you know you one. go back to long term capital management, etc. If you're old enough to remember, yeah. the, it, you know, it, black boxes work until they don't, and then they don't spectacularly yeah. badly, right? And so I am not. I I am a skeptic on on algorithmic stable coins. I'm also a skeptic on basket stable. So uh, David Marcus used to be a board member at Coinbase, and when he when he when they announced uh, what was then Libra, then became Diem, yes. I was like, wait a minute. So you're going to create a basket of stuff that no one understands. You're going to put it on a blockchain that doesn't yet exist, using wallets that don't yet exist. Like you chosen the hardest way possible to do this, and then in the end, I don't like. So I, I actually I actually said to him, I don't think you're ever launching. Yes. And, and, and so I, you know, I'm not a fan of algorithmic stable coins. I'm not a fan of basket stable coins because you and I and others can barely relate to what those are. 
But if you sat there and said, it's a digital, it's a it's not, it's not just a digital dollar, it's a programmable dollar. So you can apply a smart contract to it. Now you're talking because now you can get it to do things such that take out all these intermediaries, right? Okay, another stupid example. You and I make a bet on tonight's Knicks game, uh, tomorrow night's Knicks game, right? Okay, you're, you're, we're not geographically proximate. I don't know you. I don't really know if I could trust you. But hey, if we tied it up in a smart contract that said, if the Knicks win, pay Jonathan. If the Knicks lose, pay Asif. Smart contract settles it as soon as the, the result is known. I don't need an intermediary. I don't need to have someone hold the funds for the two of us. Like smart contracts with a, with a programmable dollar make a lot of these transactions, again, only as expensive as the resource consumption to run the smart contract. That's how you get to that's how you get to financial inclusion. That's how you drop the prices for all these transactions. I think this idea of programmable contracts is, is very interesting. Let me let me ask you a question then about the importance of the, the decentralized um, verification. So I could have, suppose I put forward another um, system, right? So there's a bunch of people that trade on a big platform, like say Amazon or Facebook or something like that. Um, and, and Amazon says, yeah, we're going to offer some ledger and we're going to maintain it, right? We will do some verification on it, but you can, you can program on it, right? So all, all people can write all kinds of contracts on this ledger. It has all these features. It's just that the, the verification is not done via decentralization, it's done via centralization. Um, from the point of view, all these people sort of interacting with Amazon and trying to write these contracts where they can do interesting trades and do all these things, what, what would they lose by, by having it um, not be on a decentralized blockchain. So, so you've got you've got a centralized body that knows every single transaction. Mm. It knows every single party in the, every transaction, mm. and it has an incentive to like you know this is the part of the Amazon problem. And by the way, I'm a fan of Amazon, just to be clear. But <laughs> Amazon looks at Amazon looks at what's happening on Amazon and says, "Oh, this product is selling like crazy. Maybe we should in-house source the product and have a generic version of it." Right? You always run that risk, and then the second risk you run is because it's a centralized database sitting under Amazon's control. How would you prevent Amazon from going in there and changing any of the values? Like, for example, I trust my bank to not have someone go into my bank account and change and drop a zero off it, right? I don't mind if they add a zero, but I really mind if they drop a zero, right? And I could never prove that they did that. Like, if they did that, I could never prove that they did that. But because the public registry on a blockchain is, is designed in such a way that you can only append data to it, you can't overwrite data. If someone goes and drops a zero off my balance or tries to, I can see the entire chain that said, I had this money, I had this money, I had this money, this transaction came along and claimed I don't have this money, right? And I can, I, can, I can actually prove when the change happened, right? Because it's an immutable database. That's, that's, that, is, that is where the real protection lies. You can only write to the database. You can't overwrite the data. I guess along this vein, maybe I'll ask about also sort of an, another attempt, maybe going back to the question about privacy from earlier, another attempt to try to um, work within the sort of current centralized system, but improve relations with privacy. So if I think about, say, the open banking regulation um, in the UK and other places that attempt to give people a right to say when their data can or cannot be used um, and to try to stop you know, centralized banks from hoarding data to allow fintech startups. I mean, to what extent do you think this mitigates some of these concerns about data security, or to what extent do you think this is not really helping relative to to what? Look, I, I, I think it's I, I think it's a a band aid and bubblegum approach trying right. to fix what is the core problem. Okay, so you'll mandate that banks have open APIs, and you'll mandate that banks do better at sharing the information, and you'll mandate that that. It, but the reality is, you're still you're still dealing with. Uh, rickety back end from uh, architected in the 60s in many in many of the Western democracies anyway, and you're dealing with banks that move slow, and so and so I think it, you know the way to guarantee that the data is open is to have it actually have it open. Okay, now we're not talking about PII. Like I'm not, we're not putting, you know, PII out there on the on the on the on the registry. So what you're doing is you're you're KYCing the wallet, right? you're then allowing the wallet to interact with the database and you're mm -hmm. allowing the, the wallet to publish transactions to the database, right. which the validators then say is valid. Okay, but my personal information is not on chain, yes. but the transactions are, and I can prove they're mine because I can show you the wallet address that they came from and I, can, and I, can, and I have the keys to that wallet. That is a far better way of driving financial inclusion. And, 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 be, and because think of, uh, for those of you who are, who are aware of it, like look at what India did with the India stack where it took a whole bunch of that information and made it, made it publicly accessible via APIs. Financial innovation and all other innovation skyrocketed. 
Yeah. Because it was no longer under the centralized control. Like it used to be available through APIs and they just said, okay, no, it's out there. It's going to look good. Same thing will happen. We're going to make this financial data in these public registries available. And the level of, of, of financial innovation that's going to occur is going to be astounding compared to what it is now. Okay, I'm going to go back to take to get some more of the questions. So I've had, I've had some more questions about regulations. Maybe I might just ask this again. So right. um, well, a follow-up, I guess. So, I mean, a, a lot of financial innovations have been followed by bubbles and financial crises. I guess, you know, the introduction of equity yep. came in and, and often the regulation yep. that follows has this profound influence. For example, you know, France really banned equity and Britain decided to continue allowing equity after the big bubbles in the, the 17th and 18th mm -hmm. centuries. And so this huge impact on the development of these two different financial sectors. I guess I'm getting a few questions about what, what you think might be kind of risks for stability with DeFi that might be particular and, you know, right. Okay. So, so, and, and, kind of, you know, longer term, yeah. kind of make sure we get good development in this sector. Yeah. And, 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 and again, to my, to, to me, DeFi is not what exists today, which yeah. is traditional financial products aimed at people who are long crypto, but rather, take today's financial products. So I want to save, I want to borrow, I want to pay, et cetera, build them on blockchain so that they're super cheap, don't have intermediary. That to me is DeFi. Okay, so with that in mind, some of the, look, one obvious risk, crypto blows up, okay? It's it's crashed multiple times before. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you know, Bitcoin, if you just track Bitcoin, you look at its history, it has this behavior where it, it bounces along for a while at a certain price point, it skyrockets, you know, probably, <laughs> It, you know, it, it skyrockets like three, somewhere between three and six X sure. and then crashes about 80%. Okay. Now it never crashes to below where it used to be. It's always yeah. above where it used to be. Right. And so over long enough periods of time, it's, it looks like a relatively, you know, nice gradient line going up and to the right, but there's immense volatility in all that. Okay. So crypto crashing right now, you know, crypto is, 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 is viewed as having crashed and in the dumper and it's no longer as popular as it used to be. If we were having the seminar, you know, two months ago, I'm sure we would double or triple the number of people that were, that were on it. Okay, fine, whatever. So that's one. Two is the, the, the kind of French reaction, which is you take what, what, you know, because of human nature, you take what happens, which is people speculate, over speculate, over lever. Like if the cab driver is talking about it, you know, you're at a market peak and you should sell, right? <laughs> and so, when that, and when that happens, the right regulatory response is not, I should shut the whole thing down. The right regulatory response is, how do I put guardrails into this thing so that the average person doesn't get killed, right? And you can't, look, it's human nature for people to speculate, right? And, 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 and unfortunately, some of the people who can least afford to speculate are the ones who speculate the most at the end of a cycle, right? And, and, and I don't, you know, when I was running Ameritrade, for example, we had all these analyses that showed that the people who traded the most lost the most money. Right. The more you traded, the worse you did. Okay. So we put a whole bunch of tools in place that said, Hey, by the way, if you make this trade, this is a tax consequence. If you make this right. trade, do you know what, like how, how confident are you that the next thing you buy is going to have this kind of return? By the way, look at these funds that track the market as opposed to try and beat the market and look at the number of funds. You know, how many funds beat the market over a year? Maybe, maybe a third best case. How many funds beat the market three years in a row? Nearly zero. Right. So, so maybe you should buy an ETF instead. Right. So, so I think, I think there are ways to get at that, that, that aren't quote regulation, right. The worst outcome is the French, is, is the French example you used where, where they just outright ban something because they think yes. it's bad. And they, they basically impede their financial system for, for centuries after that. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> I think there are some questions. I've done my best to try to integrate the questions into the, the flow of the conversation, but I think there are some that I haven't been able to get too well. So I might, if it's all right, I might ask you some remaining questions from the, the Q&A. Is that okay? Sure. So I have a question here that um, uh, quantum computers will, in the not too distant future, be able to break public key encryption. This is a threat not only to current yeah. centralized financial intermediation, but also to blockchain-based yeah. centralized financial intermediation. What is the solution from um, William Butler? That, yeah, that's an excellent question. There is no obvious solution. Uh, uh, all I would say to you is, that with every technological advance, there has been something that said, okay, it's going to tap out at this point, and then we don't know what we're going to do, right? So, so, you know, we 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 predicted the end of Moore's law a decade ago, right? And and we still somehow managed to break through that. I, so, I do think quantum computing is going to come along, and I do think quantum computing is going to is going to imperil the way we do encryption today. But I'm not sure that that means that there won't be some other version of encryption that we can use in the future that will be quantum computing, computing proof, 
you know, like, smarter people than I are going to figure that out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's very it's it's an issue well beyond crypto, I would say, right? I mean, this is yeah, a, a that's crypto. right. No, it's every every you know, it, this is NSA level stuff that that that, that we're dealing with. Like they, they're going they're, they're, there's going to be something. I, I have I have. I, 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 um, I choose to be a technology optimist, not a technology pessimist. And so I, I choose to believe that we will get, we will get an answer through technology that'll solve that problem. Um, I want to, so I've had a number of questions here coming back to sort of environmental energy efficiency issues. Yeah. Maybe I might return to that um, since, so it's, it's, I've had some questions here saying, it sounds like you're saying there's a trade-off between resource efficiency and mining cryptocurrencies and security slash privacy slash anonymity. Is that correct? And then there, there must oh, be the some way to, yeah, so I'm not sure. So yeah. there must be some way to develop an, efficient, an effective cryptocurrency while minimizing okay. negative environmental yeah. externalities. So, so maybe so, 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 we can talk a bit so, more. Yeah, so let me explain that. Yeah. Okay, Bitcoin is optimized for the average person to be able to participate in the network. That means it's designed to be able to run on your laptop. Yeah. And by that, I mean a laptop circa 2010, okay? Not a laptop circa 2021, like a, circa, a laptop 2010. The, it, that's a design feature, okay? That's a design feature. And it's designed that way to maximize decentralization of the number of nodes in the network, that yeah. anybody can be a node, okay? Take something like Definity, which is another blockchain at the other end of the spectrum. It is designed for nodes to be basically giant mid-range servers yeah. that institutions would own. And it does that because it wants the blockchain to be super fast and cope with any type of transaction at, you know, as fast as you could do them. The trade-off is yeah. virtually no one other than a big institution yeah. could be a node. Yeah. And so you are trusting these giant entities to run these nodes, and there are therefore fewer of them. And so arguably, not arguably, mathematically, that network is less decentralized than, block, than Bitcoin is. So there's a trade-off between speed and decentralization. And there's a trade-off between privacy in the sense of being able, anybody being able to, 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 to run a node at any scale and decentralization, right? These are, these are design choices that people make. And these are design choices that everyone, you know, today we make design choices around our, our applications all the time. It's just in blockchain, this is, these, these are two of the biggest ones. I think also going back a bit to earlier in the discussion. So there's another question here from Pedro. The, the economic functions of financial intermediaries are not just providing payment and settlement services. They include evaluation of collateral, of credit worthiness, monitoring of borrowers, um, how would these functions occur without intermediaries? So I might take this back to yeah. the, with the, the mortgages. Yeah. So, okay. No, I, lo I, lo I love this question. Yeah, I, I like questions. Question. I just want to go back to the example of the mortgages. So if you're trading yeah. mortgages that have already have a credit rating or they are part of a federal um, guarantee, it's much easier to not have to do those things. But more generally, how would this work? It's a good yeah, question. so, so, so that the first thing we did was HELOCs, home yeah. equity lines of credit. Okay, they don't trade with a guarantee or anything else, okay? Yeah. So what do we, we have? We have a servicing system that is real time and publishes to the to the to the blockchain. So, I don't need an intermediary to tell me if this if the if the loan is performing or not performing. I can look it up and I can see instantly if it's performing or not performing. In fact, I'd rather not pay an intermediary to do that. Okay, because the minute I'm paying an intermediary to do something, I'm trusting them, and I'm trusting that their economic their economic incentive is to tell me the truth, as opposed to someone else giving them a higher economic incentive to tell to tell me something other than the truth. Right. So. I, I'm I'm violently in favor of getting rid of these intermediaries because the blockchain can do a lot of that stuff. So like I said, real-time servicing data is there. Asset quality. Well, you got the home valuation. It's there publicly available. If you don't like the home valuation, get another one and publish it yourself, right? You, the owner of the asset, can choose to do that. And I, I the buyer of the asset, can say, I don't like the home valuation you have. It's stale. Go get another one, right? So so, so there's 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 ways in which you can... You can yeah. Blockchain... This is an oversimplification. Blockchain replaces trust with truth. I don't need to trust an intermediary. I can go see for myself what the truth is, whether it's the valuation, whether it's the servicing history, whether it's the, the FICO score, the credit score of the, of the whatever it is, right? It's, it's knowable in the registry. Right. There might be some economies of scale, though, in processing the data, right? In processing the truth. There might be, but but the, so you could, yeah, I could, I could, I could build 
a, a, a rating, a credit sort of rating agency type function on top of a blockchain and say, I'm going to gather all this real-time servicing data and I'm going to crunch it and I'm going to sit there and publish whether that's a good, you know, the borrower's credit quality is increasing or decreasing and I'm going to let, I'm going to link the transactions from that wallet to all the other transactions that wallet is making. It's fine, you can do that. So you've basically made it easier for investors or others to, to, to gather that. That's fine. And you can charge for that. But, but again, I would, I would do it in such a way that they do all that and then they publish, publish the result yeah. to the blockchain so it's knowable, right? Yeah. And they can build a smart contract that says, every time you access that piece of data, you pay me whatever my fee is for, for having produced that, that, that outcome. I think we're, we're coming to the end of what's been a very fascinating hour of conversation. Um, so perhaps maybe as a final question, um, I could ask you if, if the people listening to this are really interested in DeFi and they want to learn more or Web 3.0 and they're, they're, it's a bit of an intimidating space yeah. to try to learn about, maybe you could talk a bit about you know, how, they, how they could get involved or how they could learn more, what are some good sources and yeah, so, something yeah. Like that yeah. would be great. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I get this question. I would, I would start with, <laughs> okay, again, I came from A16Z, so remember I have a bias, right? So, <laughs> so I, would go, I would go to the A16Z crypto site and I would look at this thing called the Crypto Canon, which they have, which is basically, it starts with uh, you know, the Bitcoin white paper and then works its way down a whole bunch. This last time I looked, there were roughly you know, two dozen of some of the best sources out there, primers of how to get you up to speed on everything from what is a blockchain, how do they work? What is proof of stake versus proof of work? What is an NFT, yeah. right? All, all those things, okay, they're there. And then you can choose to go down the rabbit hole as much as, as, as yeah. much as you like, but, yeah. but there is one of the best sources of, of all the, of all the uh, crypto stuff is actually Twitter, believe it or not. There's a, whole, there's a, a pretty large community of crypto people um, on Twitter and you know, so you can do that too. Okay, well, I think we're, we're out of time, so we'll leave it there. And I, I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming and chatting to us. Um, it's been terrific. I think I've learned a lot. I hope the listeners have learned a lot. And we, we really appreciate it. My, my pleasure. Take care. Thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye.